Well, it's good to be here with you this morning. We've enjoyed being here uh, this weekend, and uh, it is good to be with brothers and sisters who serve the Lord. You know when you walk in a place and the Spirit's there, it, your spirit bears witness with it, and it, there's an instantaneous mix. There's an instantaneous yoking of the spirits together. Um, yet you know you're striving together for the things of the kingdom. And that's what you sense when you're here with your pastor. It's just been a joy being here. So I have had the privilege for quite a while at our church to do baby dedications. And, um, you know, the pastor said that we're kind of a spiritual church, which we are. We kind of call ourselves the Kerosenes, which is the Charismatic Nazarenes. So when we do baby dedications, we don't do the traditional baby dedication where you, you know, have the parents come up and you just do it. We speak prophetically over the children. We firmly believe that in each one of those children is God's plan and destiny for them. That that needs to be called forth and it needs to be cultivated in that child. And so we feel it's our responsibility to speak to that and call what God's put in them forth from that time. There's a scripture. It's uh, Psalm 139, 16 through 17. And I am going to use the PowerPoint this time, guys. <laughs> I threw them a curveball this morning and didn't use it. They were gracious. But Psalm 139, 16 through 17 says, Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were appointed for me. Whereas yet there was not one of them, even taking shape. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Pope of Commentary interprets that statement and says, basically, my life was planned out by God, and it was settled before I even began to be. See, it's not by chance who we become. It's not by chance what happens in and through us in our life. God has a plan and a purpose for that. He has a call and a destiny from that small child that I have in my arms that I dedicate to the very last day that we are on earth. Uh, We just had our second grandson about a year ago, and in that same day, we were in Pennsylvania in Pittsburgh for my grandmother's 100th birthday. We drove six hours to the other side of Pennsylvania, and I held my two-day-old grandson. That was all in one day. I went from 100 to two days. Now, let me tell you, the plan, the potential, all that was in that infant that I was holding in my arms that was two days old was put into plan before that child was ever conceived. Everything that my grandmother accomplished as a godly woman in her life for all 100 years was that potential that was in her the moment she was conceived also. That is a powerful thought. And if we can grab hold of that thought and that we know that everything about us is God-ordained, who he wants us to be, our identity, our purpose, and our plan is his plan for us, we get hold of that, it'll transform your world. It'll transform how you think. You won't think about yourself the way you do, and you won't think about others the way that you think about them. It'll change how you look at every situation that comes into you, comes over to you, comes comes across your path. It will change that because you're going to look at that not as a problem, but as a destiny in you to go through. It's not going to be just an issue. It's not going to be a person that you have to meet and build a relationship with. It's going to be God's purpose in and through you coming out into that person to bring transformation into their life. It's not your life. It's the life God has ordained for you and planned for you for the days ahead that you are operating and moving in when you're a child of the king. So our sister 
Coral this morning shared with the fact that there's three, that there's a way that we can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, that he can call you out. And that was through the word of God. You were given a Bible and the word spoke to you. It leapt off the pages. It quickened something in your spirit. Do you know why that was quickened in your spirit? Because God was speaking to her through that word. We can hear the voice of the, of the Lord. We can hear the call upon our life and the purpose and identity in our life through the word of God. She, she talked about that this morning. The second way that we can know the call, the purpose, and the destiny that God has for us is by the voice of the Holy Spirit. Listen, there are people who audibly hear the voice of God. I have not been blessed. I'm not opposed to that. But I've not had that privilege. But there are people who hear the audible voice. But for those of us that haven't, we know his voice inside. The scripture says his sheep knows his what? His voice. We turn our ear to it. We know his voice. He can speak to us. He gives us directions. He tells us what to do. He tells us what not to do also. It's as important to hear what he tells us to do as it is what not to do. There's times and situations that we get ourselves in because we didn't listen to that still small voice. That's, it is the truth. The third word, the third way that we can hear the voice, the call, the destiny that God places upon us is a prophetic word. We had that this morning. Brother came, stood, gave a prophetic word. That can bring, a prophetic word should do two, three things, excuse me. It should be, it should exhort, it should comfort, and it should edify. Now listen, that word that was released this morning for someone who was feeling that they were unsettled in a situation, they weren't sure what was going on, he released that word and told them to get themselves right back on that rock and God was going to be with them. That word edified probably someone in here this morning. It edified me. There's things that we're trying to make decisions on. It edified me. It told me if I stay right there in the center on that rock, God's not going to let my foot slip off. He's not going to let me go to the right or to the left. He's going to keep me right in the center of his will, his purpose, his plan, and his identity for me. That was a prophetic word. We hear the voice of God sometimes through our brothers and sisters when that's released. So those are the three ways that we hear the voice and the call of God. Now, there's some lessons I think we can learn as we look at the life of two spiritual giants this morning. They had a call upon their life. They walked through it, and I think as we get to the other end, there's going to be some things that we're going to be able to take and extract from that for our own life this morning. I'm not going to turn to the scriptures because they're long stories. I'm going to abbreviate them and give them just a little bit of narrative background, and then we'll talk about it. The first passage is 1 Samuel chapter 24, a very familiar story. It's the account of David and Saul in the caves of En Gedi. So we have David. Young boy, ruddy complexion. Samuel comes, lays hands on him, anoints him to be the king of Israel. But he's just yet a child. And who's king now? It's Saul. King King Saul's ruling and reigning right then. But he knows that David's going to be the king. Somewhere in the midst of that time, King Saul chooses to disobey God. God tells him to do one thing, he does the opposite. Do you know, this may be revelation, that if you do the opposite of what God tells you to do, it's sin? I don't know how to make any plainer than that. If we do the opposite of what God tells us to do, it's sin. I used to tell my children that anything less than instant obedience was disobedience. Because that moment that they hesitated to obey, they were giving way to their will. They were waiting, W-A-I-T-I-N-G, and they were waiting, W-E-I-G-H-T-I-N-G, their choice and decision, to obey or not to obey. You start to entertain that. Scripture says if your heart's already there, if your mind's already there, what is it? It's sin. Instant obedience is what God asks asks of us. Saul chose not to be obedient to God. He walked in sin. He walked in defiance to God. And the result of that was that the anointing on Saul to be the king was withdrawn. Samuel actually comes and tells him, look, the anointing's gone. You're still the king, bud. 
but there is no anointing. So Saul was simply the appointed king of Israel. He was not really the anointed king of Israel. David was the anointed king of Israel. He was waiting, and he was the anointed king, and Saul wasn't. That animosity, that hatred, that, that actual purpose to kill David consumed Saul. It's the scripture, uh, the commentator said that probably Saul chased David for somewhere between 13 to 18 years. 13 to 18 years. That's a long time. (laughs) I mean, you just, I don't know how else to say. That's a really, really long time. Can you imagine for 18 years getting up and every day, wondering if today was going to be day that Saul was going to kill you? Or as you're closing your eyes at night thinking, what if I'm ambushed tonight? That was the life that David had. Being chased like a hunted animal for 13 to 18 years. So David had gathered some men, protection around him, 600 men. Saul was chasing him down with 3,000 men. And we have this situation in En Gedi. David and his men have, have held up in this cave for protection and rest. Caves were used for that. And lo and behold, who appears in the front of the cave, the mouth of the cave, for a nap but King Saul? David's got to be going, well, his men. His men come to him and say, David, this is the day. This is the day that God told you he was going to deliver your enemy into your hand. David, this is the day we're going to be free. This is over. No more are we going to be chased like hunted animals. This is a day. They were so excited. Let me tell you, they spoke truth to David. His enemy was going to be delivered into his hand, but it wasn't the truth for that moment. David considered, he went out to the mouth of the cave where Saul was asleep, and rather than killing Saul, he cut the edge of his robe off and retreated back into the cave and convinces his men, don't kill kill Saul. That's not what we're supposed to do. Verse 5 says of that passage of chapter 24 that David's conscience bothered him. Instantly with that action of cutting that robe off, He knew that he had done wrong. He knew that he still had harmed, had brought ill against the present king who was under the protection of Almighty God. And he was wrong. So that's David. We're going to leave David in that cave for a while. He came face to face with his enemy, but we're going to leave him there for a while. We're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19. Another incredibly familiar story. This is the story of Elijah and the showdown at Mount Carmel. We all probably could tell this story. But just to give you a little bit of background, in case you're not familiar with it, Elijah was told by God to go and present himself to Ahab. Now, does everybody know who Ahab was and who his wife was? Let me just tell you a really quick funny story here. Our friends have six six children, and they're all three syllables, and all their names start with a J. And they found out they were pregnant, and my little boy, Jesse, we were talking about at the dinner table, they were trying to come up with a girl's name that started with a J. He went to bed. This kid comes out the next morning. He is elated. He's so just psyched, mommy, mommy. I said, yes, honey. He says, I have the name for Aunt Marcia and Uncle Kevin if it's a girl. I said, honey, what is it? He takes his little fingers up. He goes, Jezebel. He was so happy. Three syllables started with a J. He met all the criteria. And I said, honey, I'll let them know. They obviously chose a different name. But yeah, you just say the name Jezebel, and what happens? You just kind of go, whoa, skin crawls, right? She was a wicked wicked, wicked woman. It's not a compliment to be called Jezebel, but that's who Elijah's supposed to go to, her husband, and say, by the way, buddy, the nation of Israel is serving pagan gods, and it's, it's all resting on you. It's, this is you. This is you. The Baals and the Asherahs, this is who they're worshiping. We're going to have a showdown. We're calling this down. We're going to once and for all decide who is the king of Israel, and it's it's on. 
So they come to Mount Carmel. Carmel. Mount Carmel. Mm. Mount Carmel. 450 prophets of Baal over here. And he says to them, go ahead, pick out the two bulls. I don't want to have any issues with that. So they pick out a bull for him and a bull for them. They build their altar. They get ready. They go through all their pomp and circumstance. And then Elijah says, do your thing. And they start. And they start dancing and singing and chanting and hooping and hollering. Morning goes by. No fire. About lunchtime, Elijah comes over and he goes, guys, what's up? Do you think he's sleeping? Maybe he's on his cell phone. Could he be on Facebook? I don't know. Is he out of town? So he begins to taunt them. And that just fires up those prophets of Baal some more. By late afternoon, they're cutting themselves. There's blood all over the place. And still yet, no fire. No fire. You see, we can do stuff in a flesh. Mm -mm. We can do stuff in a flesh. It will not have results unless it's anointed by God. Nothing will come of our works of the flesh. So he dismisses them. He comes over here. And I can't imagine Elijah's heart had to be broken because he looked at the altar. It says that the altar of Israel was in ruin. See, anytime we're worshiping something in the flesh, anytime we make something an idol besides God, that altar of our heart will go into disrepair. It will never stay status quo. It will come into disrepair. It may erode, it may e slowly, but it will begin to erode. It will not stay. So the first thing Elijah had to do was he had to build up that altar again. He took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes of Israel, and he built that altar with the rocks. He put the wood on, and then he hauled that bull up there and slammed it on the altar. He then, they built, a, a dug a trench around there, and he said to the guys, he said, come on, bring up the big jars of water four times. They covered those, that sacrifice, the wood, and the rocks with water over and over and over till the trench was filled with water. And then in confidence, not in his flesh, but in confidence in God, he stepped back, gave worship to God, and asked him to show up. And we know what happens. The fire fell, the sacrifice is gone, the wood's gone, the rocks are gone, the water's gone, and the dust is even licked up by the power and fire of the Holy Spirit. That's what happens when we're in tune with God. That's what happens. That's the way we live when we have our voice but we have the voice of the Holy Spirit in tune with our ears, when there our hearts joined with him. That's the kind of power and authority that we can live in. That's the kind of power and authority that the destiny and the identity and the call and the purpose in our life can have when we stay in tune in a heart of obedience to the Holy Spirit. After all that, do you know what Elijah did? He took a sword and he chased those 450 prophets down, killed every one of them. Every one of them. Now, that's quite a day's work, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty good when you hang your sneakers up at night, kill 450 prophets of Baal. Not, it's not bad on your resume. But we go to chapter 19, and we got some bad news here. Ahab goes and runs and tells Jezebel everything that Elijah has done and how he killed all the prophets. Verse 2 says that Jezebel sends a messenger to Elijah. She basically tells him, well, she tells him this. So may the gods do to me, and even more, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Basically what she did, she put a hit out on Elijah. She really did. She called up the pagan mafia and said, hey, listen, could, there's this guy, I will pay whatever you want if he's dead by tomorrow. She put a hit out on Elijah. So Elijah hears this, and what do you think would come into your heart if you heard that? Fear, absolutely. It's a, you know, it's a normal response. God gave us fear for a reason. We stand at the edge of a, a cliff. Don't lean. Go back. There's a, there's a righteous fear. 
But this was not a righteous fear. This was not a godly fear. This was fear of man. In fact, it was a fear of a woman. It was a fear of what this woman could possibly potentially do to him. Listen, this guy had just slain 450 prophets of Baal. The power of God came down and destroyed everything. And this man, because of the words of one woman, runs for one day out of fear. Runs for his life. One day. He lays down, he sleeps. He wakes up, an angel, which I like this part, brings him food and water. He doesn't have to cook. I really like that. I do. I think that's pretty cool. It's it's just the first bed and breakfast right there. So (laughs) he eats his meal, and what's he do? He goes back to sleep. And he wakes up, and it's the second course, bread and water again, but that's okay. And then he goes back to sleep, and he wakes up. Those two meals sustained him for a 40-day journey. If we're feasting, if we're eating on the right things, we will be sustained for the journey. We will be sustained for what God asks us to do. His purpose, we will be sustained through if we're eating on the right things. If we're eating on the meat of the word and not the milk of the word, we will be sustained to do what we need to do. He will empower us. He will build us up. He will guide us. He will direct us. We will not falter. We will not faint. Our foot will not fall down. We will be sustained for the journey that he has for us. That's the word. That's if we, if we feast on that. We keep our mind stayed on that. We don't get distracted. We don't eat the fast food of the world. Listen, we can do a drive through but you're going to get the, the, the nutrition out of that about as much as the, the Twinkie if you ate it. <laughs> We're not supposed to eat a Twinkie. We're supposed to eat the meat of the Word. We're not supposed to have our ears tickled. We're supposed to listen to the mighty, strong Word of, the God, of God. Sometimes it's conviction. Sometimes he puts a finger on some things in our life. But let me tell you, he does it because he loves you. He wants to strengthen you. He wants to prepare you. He wants to groom you and take off of you what needs to be taken off so you're ready for that 40-day journey. That's what he wants to do. And that's what Elijah did. He was sustained for that 40-day journey. And where does he end up at? Mount Horeb. Mount Horeb. But he goes into a cave. Verse 9 says, he lodged in a cave. Now, the word lodge is not just sit down for a half hour and leave. When you think of someone who lodges somewhere, you have a lodger or you take up lodgings, there's some permanence there, isn't there? We don't know how long he was in the cave, but he stayed and lodged in the cave i got to tell you, I find it really interesting that we have this mighty man, King David, the future King David, in a cave being chased by Saul. And over here we have Elijah, this man who just called down the fire, who slew 450 prophets of Baal, being chased by one woman in a cave. We have two spiritual giants in caves. In my wildest dreams, I would have never thought that someone like that would have ended up in a cave if it would have been in a structure, a scripture. I would have thought they just would have just muscled their way through everything. But they were in a cave. <clears throat> have you ever been in a cave? Have you ever taken a trip in a cave? We were in West Virginia not too long ago, and we went in this cave, and we went down and down and down. And what's, what happens when you're in a cave? It's what? cold and it's dark and it's damp. It's not like an ideal place. I mean, it's not where I'd want to go on vacation or take up lodgings or hang out with 600 of my friends. But that's where these guys were, in a cave. So we're in this cave in West Virginia, and the lady's telling us the history, and all of a sudden, lights go out. Let me tell you, There was a darkness there that I'd never experienced in my life. My sister was standing here. My kids were right here, and my husband was right here. If I would have reached out, I could have touched them. But the darkness was so powerful in that moment that there was nothing in my bearings that really allowed me to know where they were except for what was in my mind. It was that pervasive. Friends, what I want to tell you 
is that's exactly where the enemy wants you to think you're at. He wants you to think that he's got you in a cave because of the things in your life, because of the circumstances, because what someone's doing to you or what's happening or your health or your finances or your kids or your job. The list is endless, and he'll try everything he can to make you retreat to a cave. It happened to Elijah, and it happened to David. I, I could follow in their footsteps mighty easily. Mighty spiritual giants. I'm not there yet. I could find myself in a cave. To be honest, I've been in a cave a few times in my life. It's a dangerous place. Not real comfortable. Very alone. You know, Elijah at one point told God twice, I'm the only one left in Israel. There's no other prophets. There's only me. I'm all by myself. It's easy to find that you set, find yourself alone in that cave. <clears throat> Satan wants you to stay in that cave. See, listen, people in here on Sunday morning, it's more than likely you already have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so the problem isn't perhaps sin as much as the enemy bullying you into that cave and you not walking into the destiny, purpose, calling, and identity that God has for you. See, it's not what you do. It's what the enemy can keep you from doing. If he keeps you fearful, if he keeps you bound up, if he keeps you in that cave, that neighbor that you have that God's asking you to speak to won't get spoken to. That testimony that he asks you to release over there at that place at work won't be released. The act of, uh, the act of uh, service that God's asking you to do for a neighbor won't happen. See, he will shut you down by keeping you in that cave. And see, he doesn't even have to get you to sin to stop doing the will of God. He just has to simply keep you in the cave. Think about that. It's a scary place, but he'll get you there if he can. He'll do everything he can to thwart you, to keep you from moving forward. There's some observations we're going to make from these two uh, scriptures. And the first one is, spiritual giants can even find themselves in a cave. You look, you know, when you list the, the spiritual giants in the Bible, definitely David is there. Elijah's there. We pedestal those people, but they still are just people like you and me. They really are. And David... And Elijah both ended up in a cave because they did what? Elijah was obedient to God and he ended up in a cave, didn't he? Didn't he do what he said? Show yourself to Ahab and then take down the, the prophets? And it drove him to a cave. David was simply waiting to become king and he ended up in a cave. So sometimes being obedient to what God asks you to do, you can still end up in a cave. Has that happened? Have you ever had that experience? You've done exactly what God's asked you to do, and you're, you're sitting there, and you're going, how did I end up here alone? Someone chasing after me, saying mean things about me. And you're like, well, how did I get here when I just simply was being obedient to God? Listen, the enemy, he'll, he'll, he'll chase, you there, chase you there because he doesn't want you to be obedient to the voice of the Lord. The second way we can end up in a cave is disobedience. Saul was in the cave be out of disobedience. Was it God's will for him to chase David down? Was it God's will for Saul to kill David and chase him down? No, it was not his will. So Saul ended up in that cave out of disobedience. So you can end up in a cave out of obedience or disobedience, either way. But spiritual giants can end up in a cave. The second thing that I think we can learn from these cave experiences is that we face really important choices when we're in that cave. Sometimes life-altering choices. They can change the trajectory. 
uh, Proverbs 18.21 says that death and life is in the power of the tongue. Now, David was in that cave. And if you remember, his men found out that Saul was there, and they came and they coaxed him to do what? To kill Saul. He listened to those men, didn't he? He touched God's anointed. Thankfully, he only cut the robe, but he still succumbed to the voice of the men that were around him, coaxing him to take action against Saul. Be careful who you listen to when you're in that cave. You can be very susceptible. You can be very open to those who seem to be sympathetic to the situation you're in. Those who come along inside and say, oh, this is so bad. You should probably do this. Or I can't believe this is happening to you. Let's work out a plan to take. And it's action against a brother or a sister or it's words that come out of your mouth or it's gossip or it's slander because they coax you into that place. The enemy will use those around you. Listen to me. This is a powerful word and you need to hear this. The enemy will use those around you to twist and turn the words to make you do and become things that God has never intended you to do. And you will look back a month, a week, 10 years later, and you'll go, my life changed at that moment because I listened to that ill word that was given to me. I was coaxed into something. I fell prey to those words because at that moment, my spirit was wounded. I was hurt. I was depressed. I was alone. What you fill in a blank, you listen carefully to who's speaking to you. And you make sure that you're listening first and foremost to the Word of God and not those around you. Because if with those friends, listen, Job's comforters, no, sorry. Listen, what they were saying and what these guys were saying in that cave was not lining up with what God's Word was. And anytime those speaking around you, their words do not line up with the Word of God, you need to shut that down and run the other direction. If it requires you to run another 40 days, you run. You do not line up with those ill words. You do not line up with words that do not, are not what God, it lines up with the word of God. Run from it. Be careful to who you listen to when you're in those places, those cave experiences. The other place, the other words that need to to be guarded carefully is self-talk. Now, most of us don't want to admit that we talk to ourselves, but we do. There's really a running commentary all day in our mind, isn't there? Oh, man, I should have not done that. That was really stupid. I can't believe I did that. Why did, you know, I should have done this first. I'm never going to get this right. My kids are never going to change. It's nonstop. And let me tell you, the self-talk you're hearing more than likely is not positive. If you were honest, if you were honest today, and I said, how many of you have self-talk that's edifying and positive? I bet you, well... It'd be slim pickings because I know what I deal with. I know what goes on in my head. I can remember as a child from five years of age on, here's words I heard. You're going to die. You're going to die. You're dying. You're dying. You're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. First thought in the morning, last thought I went to bed from my childhood on. That's what the self-talk was. And so you know it went downhill from there. Can it go downhill from dying? Yeah, it can. And that's where the enemy kept my head for years until it was called out by a minister and he laid hands on me and I was delivered from that. Because see, God can deliver you from that kind of self-talk. But negative self-talk is so, so dangerous. We can't get away from it. (laughs) We can get away from those naysayers and the people who coax you to do their own thing. But you're with yourself all the time. So you've got to be cautious. You've got to be careful. Listen, you have to have that area of your mind, that self-talk sanctified. You cannot let that run wild. You have to have that come under the blood of Jesus and allow him to cleanse that and purify that. And if it doesn't, just like the other, if it doesn't line up with the word of God, you've got to shut that down. You've got to take power and authority of those thoughts and you've got to put them under your feet just like the word says. And you need to stay your mind on him. You've got to do that. Be careful of that self-talk. Power of life and death is in the tongue. The third is the prophetic word that is given to us or our God's destiny can't be fulfilled unless we come out of the cave. 1 Samuel 24 verse 8 says, Now afterwards Dave arose, David arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, saying, My Lord and King. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed on his face to the ground and he prostrated himself. 
David had to come out of that cave. He could not stay in there because when he walked out of that cave at that moment, he confessed his sin against Saul. He made himself in a right relationship with Saul, and he made himself, therefore, in a right relationship with God. And as a result, he was able to steward. He was able to carry. He was able to carry that anointing to be the king. He brought himself into that place so he was able to be the anointed king that God had him to do to be. He would have never done that. He would have perhaps never been what God needed him to be if he would have stayed in that cave and not made that confession. You have to come out of the cave. Elijah, it's no different. He's at Mount Horeb. 1 Kings 19.11 says, God says to him, go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. So he tells him to come out of his lodgings of the cave and to go to the front of the cave, to the mountain of Mount Horeb. And what happens once he extricates himself, once he removes himself from that place? What happens? He has an encounter with God, doesn't he? First, there's the mighty rushing wind that tears up the rocks. And then there's the earthquake and there's the fire. And then finally, that still, small voice, that gentle, gentle breeze that comes across Elijah. Do you know what happened in that instant? That stronghold of fear was broken in Elijah in that moment because he had an encounter with a living, breathing, powerful God. He was restored into that place, that stronghold of his mind that made him think that he was the only prophet, that God didn't care for him, that his zealousness in all his works was for naught, was broken. That stronghold was broken when he moved out from the place that he was in that cave. Verse 16, 15 and 16 says, he tells Elijah, the Lord does, to go and return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And then he gives him three things to do. He says, when you've arrived, you're going to anoint Hazel, king over Aram. You're going to anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, to be the king over Israel. And let me just give you a caveat there. Do you know who Jehu was? He was the one that exterminated the lineage of Ahab. Stop for just a second. If, if Elijah wouldn't have anointed and called him to be the king, perhaps the lineage of Ahab would have continued. Think about that. But he had a purpose. He had a destiny to go and lay hands on Jehu. So that evil was un- exterminated powerfully. Had to happen. And then the third thing he, went, he did was he laid hands on Elisha and carried on the lineage of the prophetic at that moment. Both of these men had to come out of the cave. In this room this morning, I know there's a call on people. I know there's a destiny. There's an identity. There's a purpose that God has for every single one of you. And maybe, just maybe, you're in a find, you, you find yourself in a spot where you're in a cave. You've been pushed there or bullied there. You've moved there out of fear. You know God's asking you to do something. And you just it seems impossible. God wants that to be fulfilled in your life. Everything that was written in the book that's in the heavenlies for you, God wants to bring to completion. But he needs you to come out of the cave. Whether you're in the cave from obedience you're in the cave from disobedience. It matters not. God wants you out of the cave. He'll still do the work in you that needs to be done. And so this morning, altars are open. The altars are not some place we run from. It should be some place we run to. Remember, Elijah went over and he repaired the altar. We run to that place. It's a place where the blood meets us. It's a place where the power encounters us. It's a place where our hearts are transformed. It's a place where God makes right what's wrong. He repairs the breach. He restores what's been stolen. So very simply, if you're in a cave and you'd like prayer, just invite me forward. Because the same God that encountered Elijah will encounter you here today.